out of the way, let's get back to our lesson for today. We're going to pick up and act in our notes, Act 2, Scene 4, where we, we kind of left off last week uh, in regard to um, Peter and the call of Cornelius. So we're going to pick up there and, again, attempt to try to finish out these notes. I don't want to go so fast that we're not able to keep track, but um, I, there's a lot to cover here. So I'd like to get through that all today. And someone asked me last week, is it okay if we don't hear you that we can like raise our hand on a fill in the blank? Yes, please do. If you need to hear something repeated, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'd be happy to, to mention that for the fill in the blanks as we go along here. Don't, don't be afraid for some of that participation. Yes, and there's an answer book. And so if after the class, maybe you don't want to raise your hand. And so either after the class or after the morning service, I believe it's in the usher's closet. Um, you can go there and we have an answer key to each of the Sunday school lessons. What's that? Yeah, on the top, on the top little shelf there. Um, so you can get the answers there if you need to follow up with anything. Um, I don't have them memorized. So if I don't have the book in front of me, I probably... What was number 64? I, I can't tell you right now. But we do have that answer key available to you. All right. So Peter has continued to show to himself, his God and the world, that he is a changed man. His preaching is bringing the gospel to thousands of people at a time. And his ministry continues to expand beyond the borders of Jerusalem as churches are being established among the Gentiles. And so the, the word has gone out to the Samaritans. Some have gone out to the Gentiles. And Peter, remember we talked about last week in, in number, uh, I think it was scene number three, he made the trip to go and visit. Uh, uh, he went to answering the call. He went down to the, visit the Samaritans. And, and again, this is so far outside of what they would normally do culturally. But God is, is, is extending this call and using people like Peter to be an example to go beyond you know, maybe a, a cultural or societal prejudice or whatever it may be, and to take the gospel truly to every creature. So this, this call has gone out, and Peter's beginning to expand his horizons as well as the other believers there in Jerusalem. But this next step, scene four, that we're going to talk about here regarding the story of Cornelius, and this is in Acts chapter number 10. If you'll turn there, Acts chapter number 10, we'll reference a few verses here today in this passage regarding the story of Cornelius. But a lot of these stories, you could just take an entire Sunday school lesson and teach about um, the different encounters. So we don't have time to read the entirety of these passages. Um, but we, I do want to help to establish some of the context. So we will be reading portions of this to make sure we can keep up uh, with the story. So the, this encounter that we're going to begin with today is going back to Act 2, Scene 4. And this is, I'm going to just review this paragraph if you missed some of these fill-in-the-blanks. But in regards to this paragraph here, it says, Peter's persistent prejudice. And as I mentioned, you can tell these are our pastor's notes with the alliteration he has used uh, in these notes. But it's Peter's persistent prejudice, number 40. If visiting the Samaritans, number 41, the Samaritans, was distasteful to Peter... Visiting the Gentiles, number 42, was far worse. Certainly he had no intention of doing that. You know, they were, they were called to go to uh, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. He was there. He was a part of that call and that commission in the end of, obviously, Matthew and Mark in these chapters, but also in Acts chapter number 1, where he said that you'll receive power to go and do these things. He was there for those calls, but uh, this is definitely... Now, let's think about this for a second. God has called us all to do a lot of things, but we may not necessarily feel like, well, that's not going to be my responsibility. You know, oh, yeah, we should definitely send missionaries all over the world, but <laughs> I'm not going to be a missionary. You know, we can get this idea that, oh, well, that's for somebody else to do. And Peter, it appears, had a similar kind of mindset because of some of the resistance he experiences here in this passage that we'll look at in regards to this call to the Gentiles. That it's not just about those who are locally there around Israel and Judea and Samaria, but the gospel is to go out everywhere. And so Peter has some of these questions and struggles a little bit here in this passage that we'll look at because this is a whole new experience for him. So we can barely imagine the difficulty of embracing Samaritans who believed, number 43, Samaritans, but number 44, Gentiles. Then in, here in our context, Acts chapter number 10, he had a heavenly vision and the Lord led him to Caesarea, the Roman capital of Palestine, to meet a Gentile soldier named Cornelius. Now, the illustration that pastor has included here in the notes is, can you imagine the mind of a Jewish, Jewish zealot like Peter now in the home of a Gentile? 
This was not something that was commonly done. And if you remember, Jesus Christ was criticized by the Pharisees that he sat down and he ate with publicans and sinners. And this was very much a frowned upon activity in the traditional Jewish culture. But uh, the love of Jesus Christ goes beyond tradition. It went beyond the law. In fact, it completed it. And now uh, the, this, this connection and relationship to God has been open to all. So back to the illustration. What if they want you to eat with them? What if they ate <laughs> you put your pork chops, ham and eggs for breakfast? Because there were such strict dietary standards for those who would follow the law and follow tradition that supping with the Gentiles, they may have foods that are unclean. And as it also as it says here, what if the meat had been offered unto idols and they weren't supposed to eat of that meat and these things? So, um, and rare, no way. You know, Peter, he asked this question, Peter, what are you doing? And I love this just simple response, obeying, obeying. It went beyond, again, his comfort level, what he was accommodated to or accustomed to in his culture and in his upbringing and understanding. And he went beyond that to minister and, and obey the call of God. So the vision was not just to, uh, uh, that he received here in Acts chapter number 10 that we're about to read. He, he didn't receive this just to expand his menu choices and to say, oh, well, now you can eat whatever you want. But rather to further stretch the understanding of Peter. The gospel was not just to the Jews or even just to the Samaritans, but those were, but even to those who were without and still in need. So Acts chapter number 10, let's look at some of this passage here to gain some understanding of the context. And we'll start in verse number 9. On the morrows they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry. We can all relate to that, right? He became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. This is a very typical dad-style nap. You know, it's been right, right after work, maybe right before dinner, there's that period of time where, you're like, well, can't eat. I might as well take a nap. So that's what he's doing here. Verse number 11. And, he, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. So there's a giant tablecloth, if you will, coming down from heaven in front of him. He's dreaming about food even. And saw, uh, verse number 12, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So he's having this dream, but we also, we understand it's a vision from God about food. It's not just because he's hungry, but God is using his hunger as an illustration here for him. So, he's, so he brings down these vessels. There's these, all these kinds of animals that are, again, unclean to him to eat. Verse number 14, but Peter said, not so, Lord. This is not the first time he said something like this to, to, to the Lord. He did it to Jesus personally when he said that, hey, I have to go up here because they're going to crucify me. Oh, not so, Lord. I'm going to die for you. This would never happen. Uh, some habits are, are hard to get, uh, kill here. So not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Lord, I, I've, I've kept the law. I've kept the tr tradition. I've never eaten these kinds of unclean animals. And why would I go and do such a thing now? Uh, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou um, that call not thou un, or that, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So three different times Christ challenges, just like three other times he has said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Um, in, uh, as we've read previously in the Gospels. So now here Jesus again is coming to him these three times saying, Hey, no. This is for you to eat. This is for you to eat. This is for you to eat. And then uh, these things were received up again. Now while Peter doubted in himself that this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. See, even Peter, after he had this vision, he's like, man, that's a really weird dream. He didn't fully understand yet that this was from the Lord. Verse 18, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. So, Three men have already been dispatched by Cornelius because Cornelius also had his own vision and desire to know God. And he tried to do everything he could, but he just didn't know how to be saved. He was, a, he was an upstanding man. And so he's, he inquires after to go, sent to go find Peter. And so these three servants, just like the three times that Jesus Christ had called, or that God had called unto him here in this passage, there's these three men who arrive here. And so while Peter thought in the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. So while these guys are showing up here and asking about where he's from, the spirit now is ministering to him and says, oh, hey, by the way, there's three men here. 
So the three and the three from the vision. Well, so verse number 20, Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So don't just go, but doubting nothing. That he would go and he would uh, then proceed forward to, to go to Cornelius' house. God was trying to prepare Peter for this commission. As odd as it may have seemed, he didn't understand the vision. These men tell him that there is a man named Cornelius and he is searching for God and he is being asked to come and speak with him. So a couple of verses down, we'll skip down to verse number 24. And the morrow after they entered in Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them. Cornelius was so desirous that he wasn't just, you know, oh, I'm in the back, I was taking a nap. No, he was waiting for them to arrive. And they called together his kinsmen and near friends. This is so important that he gathered together all his family together for this meeting. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. Am a man. So then at, following this context here, they, they both kind of replay the visions and the dreams and the desires that they have. And Peter preaches the gospel and those who were there call on the Lord and believe. In verse number 44, it says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they had seen it happen in, in Jerusalem. They had seen it happen in Judea. They had seen it happen now in Samaria with, with Philip. And so they had, they'd seen these different events. And now they're out in the Caesarea of Philippi. And so they've arrived here. And now there is the, a man who has received not only salvation, but also the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So they had not seen it. They, well, this was just the Jews. We're special. This was, this was our gift. This was our thing. No, but God is saying that, no, this is for all people. And it's so illustrated well here um, in this passage. So in uh, the, the rest of this paragraph here, we'll pick up back in pastor's notes here. It says, Peter listened to the number 45, the words of Cornelius. Number 45, the words. And saw number 46, the witness Number 46, the witness of his newfound walk evidenced by the number 47, the work of the Holy Spirit. The work, number 47. And so suddenly Peter found no place for prejudice. Peter, once he arrived there and saw the desire of Cornelius and of all the family and everyone who was there, he decided it kind of helped him to let down his guard and say, well, hey, I, we're, I'm a man just like you. I'm nothing special. He had kind of dropped against some of those prejudices after he saw his humility and his desire for the Lord. The Holy Spirit coming down in power and his presence filled the place like Pentecost. I'm sure it was a familiar feeling for, for Peter there. And number 48, the Samaritans, number 48, the Samaritans, through their conversion to Christ, came into the church, and now the door was open to number 49, again, the Gentiles. The Gentiles. God, uh, by the confirming work of the Holy Spirit. So again, they're seeing the Holy Spirit manifested, not just in Jerusalem and Judea, but now in Samaria and even now amongst the Gentiles, the uttermost part of the earth. God chose, number 50, Cornelius for Peter. Number 50, Cornelius for Peter. And Peter for the number 51, the church. 51, the church. Both men obeyed the word of God and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so the work of God is accomplished. So both the word of God, the witness of the Holy Spirit, and the work of God, this is how the will of God is completed. And so Cornelius, this encounter wasn't just a happenstance. This wasn't just a random event that, oh, some guy named Cornelius just happened to find Peter's house and just happened to go. No, these things were all ordained by the Lord and then recorded for us to learn from this example that, um, again, even in our own witnessing, and we've, we've kind of touched on this a couple times, that we in our own witnessing can maybe have an encounter with somebody has anyone ever encountered somebody or maybe even seen somebody and the Holy Spirit put on your heart that you need to go speak with them or invite them to church or give them a track or leave a witness, whatever it is, and we make excuses for ourselves? Oh, well, they don't look that interested. Oh, they look busy or, oh, I don't agree with their lifestyle choice and so, you know, they probably don't even want to hear me and, oh, well, you know, they're, they're living in sin. They're not going to listen. Whatever it is, we make excuses for ourselves to not follow after. And this is a great picture of that. Cornelius received this vision and dream, and what was that about? And then he had these men show up and call him to the Gentiles, which took a step of faith, and, and it says, doubting nothing. Hey, I don't want you to go and have any doubts or fears. Just follow me. And from that, this, the entire household was saved. 
So let, let's not get too caught up in our own prejudices that we may have um, in regards to sharing the gospel because everyone needs to hear the good news. So then moving on here to Act 2, Scene 5, and the next page in your notes, Act 2, Scene 5. This is number 52, Peter's personal presentation. Peter's personal presentation. And this is in Acts chapter number 11, so you should be able to keep your scriptures open. Right there to Acts chapter number 11. And we'll read on in pastor's notes here. So back to Jerusalem, the brethren, the elite, these were again the church of Jerusalem. They were waiting to hear what was happening in Caesarea. No doubt some news preceded Peter's arrival, because bad news always does. And they were no doubt ready to let Peter have it, but Peter spoke and went first. So look in our, look in our passage here in Acts chapter number 11. Let's start in verse number 1. Because again, Peter is on this personal journey as he is discovering for himself through, through the work of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is not just to us. The gospel is to all the world. And he is having to drop his prejudices and, and be welcoming to these people and sharing the gospel. So this is a personal journey he's been on. And back home in Jerusalem, they're hearing about Peter going to the house of a Gentile and, and, and eating with them and supping with them and these things. And they're more caught up in the infraction against the law and tradition rather than realizing and rejo rejoicing, hey, people are being saved. They're more concerned about those things. And so they're not real happy about it. Acts chapter 11. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. This should be a cause for, again, rejoicing. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem... That uh, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So there's a group of law followers, tradition followers, who are saying, you know, hey, what are you doing going to the Gentiles? What are you doing going and eating with them? What are you doing transgressing the law, the traditions of men? How could you do such things? Saying, thou went into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. And, and I, I hope that this is never the case, but I would hope that rather, again, we could celebrate and rejoice. When people who are, for, for people who are saved, even if they don't look like us and think like us. You know, if we don't ever have anybody in our church who kind of looks out of play, place, maybe they're not dressed in a suit, maybe they're not dressed in a skirt, and maybe they've got, you know, uh, wild hair or tattoos or whatever else. If we never have those people in our church, we ought to be concerned. Because we're supposed to be actively reaching those who are without. We're not just looking for other people like us. This church is going to grow by us going out and finding those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who have no hope or direction, and they're looking for those things. And not, they're not just going to find it here because we're such great people, but rather we serve a great God. So through the bus ministry, through the website, through, the, through just passing out tracks and being in our community, we ought to have a constant flow of people in here who maybe don't quite fit the norm, but that's because we're trying to reach people. We're not trying to make them follow after our traditions. We're not trying to make them follow after... Um, you know, some, even some missionaries will make this mistake where they'll go and travel abroad to a, a foreign country. And they basically go not necessarily to share the gospel in their culture, but they go to kind of try to Americanize the people there. And so they'll go and they'll make them dress a certain way or act a certain way or whatever else. And rather than trying to say, hey, let's just bring the gospel to where they're at and how can the gospel change the society and culture they're in, they try to go and bring the traditions of of the church or of their beliefs or whatever it is. And so Peter there is just going, he's trying to take the gospel to those who need it, and they're upset that he transgressed this tradition and law. So back to our context. So he, verse 3, that went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. And so he gives here the entirety of the illustration of, oh, I had this vision, there's this man Cornelius, and he kind of replays the whole situation. So um, over time, God is using these instances and others to break the tradition and show that there is a better way, a way of love and compassion that includes even the Gentiles. So let's go back to our notes here where it says in bold note, how much has Peter changed uh, that, he would, that he would have been in the seat of the scornful with the others who didn't go to Samaria or Caesarea, but Peter is a different man. Before this trip, before he went to uh, to go and visit the Samaritans before he went to go and see Cornelius, he may have been sitting in that same seat of those at Jerusalem, scolding and scorning, saying, oh, how dare you do such a thing? But God, again, is doing this personal work in him. And so he has arrived at this place, and now he is pleading on behalf of these lost people. But, so he's a different man. Peter is filled, a spirit-filled, spirit-led man, 
and he spoke with power and also then prevailed and was convincing. And the illustration Pastor gives here is, says, is, if only we could have been there to see it and to experience it. God's grace was displayed. This would be an empowering message of worldwide evangelization to any and all who believe that they will receive. And that's the same gospel we have today. It hasn't changed in thousands of years. The same thing that we want to share it to anybody who will listen and, and, and pray that they would receive salvation. Don't make your Christian testimony about your church or your pastor or your spouse, but rather, hopefully you have a personal presentation testimony that God is working in your life. Uh, each and every one of us have a calling to present Christ in a worthy fashion to a lost world. And Peter is realizing this truth, and he is trying to then teach others also. He's trying to convince those that there is a better way, there is, there is, um, that this is the way that God has commanded us to, to go about in this world, again, to share the good news of the gospel. So Peter's personal presentation here in Act 2, Scene 5. Now, moving on to scene number 6, Peter's persistent preaching. Act 2, Scene 6, Peter's, this is number 53, Peter's persistent preaching preaching. Uh, this is one of the shorter points here, so we'll just kind of read through here, and then we'll add some notes at the end, but in, in, it refers to Acts chapter number 9. The, the call that came to the church was finding the apostles, number 54, finally following. The call that came to the church was finding the apostles, finally following. It took time for them to adjust to this new path, uh, if you will, uh, that they would set out on in regards to their walk with the Lord. First, there was Philip to Samaria. Then an unsuspecting Peter goes down to Joppa. Then Lydda, where uh, there were men with, the Paul, men with palsy at Dorcas, whom he raised from the dead. This was his cause, to be a fisher of men. Back when Jesus Christ told him that, hey, I'll make you a fisher of men. He is speaking again prophetically of this ministry that Peter would have, where he would be traveling and preaching and, and reaching multitudes for the cause of Christ. God opened the door to number 55, the Gentiles. Number 55, Gentiles, as we just read in the previous chapter, and farther beyond our borders. Paul would go on farther, but Peter was the one who first preached to the Jews, number 56, and the Gentiles, and uh, who would be the first century church. The first century church wasn't just built out of Jerusalem amongst believing Jews but rather is comprised of all of these other churches. And Peter had a, a, an integral part in starting many of these, these churches and ministries. So, uh, and some notes here. Throughout these encounters with Peter, we see a boldness and willingness in his heart that he will do what needs to be done to follow Christ. We are far removed from the man in the garden and the denials that, of that dreadful night. Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, all were being reached because of his and others' persistency in getting the good news out. This example ought to challenge us to never back down in the face of societal pressures, but rather keep looking unto and preaching Jesus Christ. He had to go against his own brethren. He had to go against, again, even some of their own uh, traditions and what society, and what he, how he grew up. He had to go against those things in order to accomplish God's will because God's will is greater than culture, greater than society. But God's will um, ultimately will prevail, and, and Peter is following in that path to see that he does his part. So he had, he had a very persistent ministry, and again, that's a great example for us. Now, this next scene here is going to take a little bit more time to develop, so we'll kind of walk through some of this passage here in Acts chapter or Acts 2, scene 7. Um, there, we're going to look at two separate passages, if you will, and one is in Galatians chapter 2, as is listed in the notes, but we're also going to look at Acts chapter number 15. So if you can have both of those places open, we'll be referencing both of these occasions, because again, there's a greater context to this passage that I'd like to establish. So, Act 2, Scene 7. Peter put in his place. Peter put in his place. We've been looking at some amazing things that Peter has done. His willingness to go out, to obey, the, to obey the will of God, the call of God to go to the Gentiles, to go and visit the churches of Samaria and these different things. And we, we talked about the man with the palsy, or you know, the man who was uh, born lame and couldn't walk and um, at the gate beautiful at the beginning of this lesson. But we've seen Paul do some incredible things. But Paul, or sorry, not Paul, Peter. But Peter's still a human. Peter's still, just as he said to Cornelius, I'm just a man. And Peter is in no way perfect. And in this passage, we see a con there's a conflict between Paul and Peter that's presented in Galatians 
chapter number two, where, where Paul gives his testimony of this encounter. But there's some backstory to it that I feel like is appropriate. And it's actually, we were just teaching about this um, in the school next door, in the, the FBCA Bible class for the high schoolers. We just covered some of this content. So I think it's, it'd be pertinent to cover in regards to that because these two situations have to do with each other. So let's read through this first paragraph and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll kind of get through um, some of the, the context and the backstory here. But number 58, Peter put in his place. The focus was still the Jerusalem church. And he put mega churches. It was a large church there filled with Jewish believers. But there was a church in Syria called Antioch. Barnabas and Saul, who would, again, or Barnabas and Paul, would labored here among Gentile believers. And here God had built a great church, a model church, and they reached to the othermost. So this church in Syria has a great testimony. And number 60, again, Antioch, number 61, reached to the uttermost. Peter never returned any farther from here. Paul will press on to Jew and Gentile alike. But the conflict that arose between these two places, number 62, these two places, and these two, number 63, personalities. Ah, now we see it's a personality, one of the personality conflicts. Uh, Peter, we know to be a very bold and brash person. And if you've read any of your New Testament, you understand Paul is also a very bold and brash person as well. And when you get two of these men in the same room, it doesn't always end well. And so the, but they both had great impact on first century churches. Now, I'd like to go now to Acts chapter number 15 and give some backstory. Acts chapter number 15 contains what is known as the Jerusalem Conference. And this, is a, this, is a, this situation has arisen because of what we've been talking about, that there were people who were known as Judaizers. They had gone about trying to proclaim that, yes, Jesus Christ, you must accept salvation. Yes, indeed. But also you have to have the law. You also must be circumcised. You must follow these things. And so they were basically trying to mix essentially works and salvation because they believe that, well, you still have to do the works of the law and follow those things, but also you need Jesus Christ. And we understand from what we know of the Gospels and what we believe is that there's nothing else you need besides Jesus Christ for salvation. No works, nothing at baptism, all those things, none of those will save you. Only accepting the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ will save you. Baptism is a testament of what you believe. It is not essential for your salvation. So that's what, that's what we believe here, and we believe it to be scriptural. But we had this first group, basically, of the, kind of teaching this false religion that it's a mixture of works and salvation. So in Acts chapter number 15, starting in verse number 1, And a certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So here it is. So they're, they're mixing again works and salvation. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, this is verse 2, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So Paul and Barnabas tried to kind of dispute and contend with them somewhat to try to figure out, you know, uh, uh, to try to straighten out these guys and what they believe, but yet they, they will not be convinced. So they come to an agreement that they say, you know what, we ought to take this to the church. They, they make some good, I'm sure they made some good points as to what they believe. And so Paul and Barnabas countered, but they couldn't come to agreement. So rather than actively try to, you know, fight against each other, they decided let's take it to the, to the proper church authorities here. So, but here's an interesting little insert that we have here in verse number three. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria. So again, the Samaritans declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So, the, the salvation that Paul and Barnabas are sharing here is not, the, the, is not what these Judaizers are trying to preach. Rather, they're preaching, hey, works and salvation. You still got to be under the law and you got to be circumcised. You've got to do these things in order to be saved. But rather, Paul and Barnabas, as they're going on, they're preaching the salvation amongst the Gentiles that just simply like the Bible states, and as our Lord and Savior said, you just need to believe on him to be saved. So, what, what kind of results were there from these teachings? Well, from, the, from these men who showed up, these Judaizers who came down, the, what came from them was conflict. But rather, if you look at the, what the gospel brought in regards to what Paul and Barnabas were preaching, it was conversion. There was rejoicing. People were being saved. The, the, the results of their stories and of their encounters were much different. So 
they arrive here at Jerusalem. They get there. They kind of explain the situation, if you will, um, about, about the contention, about why, why they believe this, why they believe that. And Peter speaks up um, in verse number 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, referring to Cornelius. Then God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Not by works, not by the rule following and traditions and everything else, but rather, again, by faith that they would have their hearts purified. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither of our fathers nor were we able to bear? Hey, we're not able to, com- to complete the law and keep it. Why are we now trying to put this upon other people? It's obviously a system that doesn't work. And now we have this, this freedom in Jesus Christ. So Peter steps up and disputes it. And then James gets up as the, the elder and the pastor there, uh, the senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem. And he delivers a, a verdict there, which we'll look at in a second here. But um, there was this, this, this disagreement that arose. And uh, let's read the pastor's illustration to kind of catch us now up to where we're at in this context. Perhaps the prejudices of the past persisted even with Peter. Perhaps it was a matter of class or culture. The Hebrew Christians were not ready to receive Gentiles equally. In Jerusalem, it was more obvious than in Antioch. But some questions arose concerning requirements of Gentile believers to be more conformed to Jewish believers. And this is what we're talking about here in this context. So James sent Peter, and this is uh, referring to Galatians chapter number 2, where we'll look at in a moment. James sent Peter to investigate, and after some time he sent a contingency from the Jerusalem church, a council to inquire. The delegates quite intimidated Peter, and the old Peter slash Simon emerged, and he succumbed to their Jewish legalism and separation, and seemed to forget what had been accomplished. So, uh, James steps up in, in verse number 13 of our, of back in Acts chapter number 15 and basically is going to deliver the final verdict on this situation. Uh, verse number 14, uh, we'll skip there. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all thing, all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication, from the strangled and from blood. So, the, the things that he declares, he says, no, hey, this, we are going to send this to, to the Gentiles. We're not going to put this yoke upon them. Uh, but rather, again, they just need to believe by faith. But rather, there's this re- kind of request that you abstain from these things. This is not a requirement at all for salvation. And this was kind of the verdict that came out. So from here, uh, it, they, they, these commissions are sent out of the church to go into the different regions and let people know that, hey, if there are people here that are preaching... Again, a works in salvation, but that is not the case. But rather, you know, through this delegation that is assembled here at this church, uh, we, we have determined that these things to be scriptural. He's referring to Old Te- the Old Testament here. So he says that here, here's the, the decision that we've made, and this is what, what should be preached. And so they send out these delegations to go now back to all the churches. Well, uh, Paul and Barnabas head back out to Antioch uh, in verse number 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. So they shared the letter of what was shared there. Um, and then we'll, we'll jump down here uh, to verse number 33. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding a pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So some of the commissions then went back to Jerusalem or dispersed to other locations. But Paul and Barnabas and Silas decided to stay there in Antioch. Now between verse number 35 and 36 is where now we're going to look at Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2. And this will be the conversation that happens because while they are in Antioch, they're abiding and preaching. This is what Pastor said in his illustration. Now... Peter is sent here. So Peter is sent down in Galatians chapter number 2. 
verse number 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they into the circumcision. So, again, this is the part of that delegation that they were sending out. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So what happened to Peter? What happened when he showed up here? Uh, this commission was not sent so that they could confirm it. Or it was sent so they could confirm the ruling of the conference and that they would not be under the law. Peter also came out as a follow-up, but he had a trouble abiding by the ruling that even his home church had just proclaimed. So look here in verse number uh, 12. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter's arrived in Antioch. He's sitting down like he did with Cornelius. And he's sitting down and he's eating with the Gentiles. Uh, uh, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. So Peter came to Antioch, sat down, ate with Gentiles, you know, partook of their meals, had fellowship with them, these uncircumcised, the unclean that they had now just said, you know, we're not trying to put them under the, the bondage of the law and these different things. So this was the read, this was the verdict. Again, Peter even speaking up again, previously saying that, you know, hey, the, the, we're not supposed to do this. So he's, he's following what he said, but there's another commission that comes from Jerusalem. There's another group of these people who come down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And when they show up, Peter changes his tune. Peter, rather than sitting and eating with the Gentiles and fellowshipping with them and, and, and abiding with them, separates himself from the Gentiles. He's going back to, again, his old Peter mode. Now he's, now he's falling back under the peer pressure, if you will, around the situation. So um, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Because Peter was in a place of leadership and authority, people looked at him as an example they see him separate themselves once these guys show up. So, that, well, I mean, if Peter's doing it, well, well I guess I got to do it. So they separate themselves as well. And, uh, and they were Jews. And then in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So even Barnabas is getting caught up in, the, in this, in this uh, situation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them, if thou being a Jew livest after the man of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? I can't imagine the, just how awkward this moment would have been there in this, where I don't know if they're in a meeting hall or whatever it is in this church. He was abiding, he was eating with them, he's, he's fellowshipping with them. These Jews show up and they're from Jerusalem. And so he gets up, separates himself, and other people see Peter do it. So now there's like two sides to the room where they all kind of separated themselves. And then Paul sees this hypocrisy and decides to stand up and say, Hey, why is it you're saying that you're, you, that the, you're going to live like a Gentile? You're going to eat with them. You're going to sup with them. You're going to you know, partake of their meals or whatever else. Why are you going to do that? But now that they're here, oh, now you're trying to live like a Jew. Now you're trying to separate yourself. Now you're trying to you know, think yourself better or whatever it is and separate yourself from them. So uh, he stands him to the face and, and makes his bold declaration here and call, basically calls him out. So let's try to wrap this up here real quick. We're so close to the end. Go back to our notes here, uh, this paragraph right under illustration. Peter had been, number 64, a leader, not a follower, number 65. Peter had been a leader, not a follower. But times and seasons bound new personalities and places, cultural and conditional changes, actually complacency, Compromise and perhaps cowardice prevailed. So rather than lead in the way he should, he fell under and just became a follower under the pressures that were brought to him. When Peter should have, should, should have stood up, as once he did, he sat down with the wrong crowd. The Apostle Paul was sent from God, number 66, he was a confronter. Number 66, he was a, a confronter. And number 67, and he confronted. He did that thing which he was called to do. He confronted Peter to his face. He didn't, he didn't post it on social media. Obviously, they didn't have it, but he didn't you know, write little secret letters and notes and gossip and these different things and try to sow discord. Rather, he just stood up and handled it right there in the moment. Uh, and he did so to number 68, correct him. He wasn't trying to condemn him. He wasn't trying to you know, say that he was a terrible person or something like that. 
brother who's trying to correct him because he was being a, a poor example for those people there. And to keep the church in order. It must have been painful to Peter, but Paul's word prevailed. Peter was put in his place, problem solved, and they both pressed on. Peter did not hold resentment to Paul. But he was deserving of the rebuke. And later in 2 Peter 3.15, he even spoke of him as our beloved brother, Paul. In the moment, I'm sure Peter didn't feel like, oh, my beloved brother Paul is calling me out in front of all these people. Probably not how he felt, just like you don't feel that way. But maybe later after time and perspectives as has settled in, he can look back and say, oh, you know what? He did that for the right reason. I was in the wrong. And he was a beloved brother because he cared enough about me to say something. So this closing scene, we need to read through this here and then we'll dismiss. As the curtain is drawn, Nero is burning Rome and blaming the Christians. The Roman church claims that number 69, Peter, is abiding in number 70, Rome. Although no evidence exists to support that claim or many others that accompany it. What we do know is Nero was a tyrant. He disgraced the throne of Rome, horrible, a horrible crimes he committed, cruel persecutions against Christians, and a foremost enemy was Peter the ringleader, who was one of the twelve and the leader of the inner circle of three. The Jews prophesied, or, uh, Ju uh, Jesus prophesied Peter's death in John chapter number 21, and tradition says that he was crucified upside down. We don't know for sure, but we do know for sure he had a glorious welcome home. Let's just read this here real quick. Peter's life was radically transformed by his encounters with Christ and the subsequent, subsequent situations that would be presented to him. Your life story is made up of what you do with the situations that God places you in. Some are uphill battles where we stumble and strive to make it through. Others maybe are the mountaintops experiences where we get to see the results of the, our labors. And sometimes they're down in the valley where things don't seem like they could get much worse. Your season where you're at right now is exactly where God wants you. May we seek every day to be less like our old selves, less like the Simon of the past, the, the immaturity um, and these things, that we could lay those things aside, but rather to look to be a better and bolder version of who, our, who we should be. Just like how we saw with Peter. how he, he, Yes, he was still Simon in the sense that he had a sin nature and we see those mistakes come through, just like we're going to continue to make mistakes. But even as we noticed there that even uh, with being corrected, he received the correction and didn't hold it against Peter, uh, Paul. He didn't you know, have a grudge against him, but rather was able to forgive him and see the benefit of it. So we ourselves, too, hopefully we're continuing to grow and mature, just like we saw through the example of Simon to Peter.